in way of background, I'm a pediatrician. Um, I've practiced for more than 15 years in the state of Pennsylvania. I previously was a primary care physician, and now I'm a child abuse physician um, and as part of the child protection team at Children's Hospital for about the last 11 years. Um, I was asked to briefly talk about four issues, um, each of which we could discuss for hours, so this is really a very, very brief summary. Um, the four problems, and I'm going to talk about the problem and then the solution, are child line, general protective services tracking, information sharing, and child protective services workers training. Um, the first of those issues is child line. Um, as you know, this is the number that we call when we have a concern of abuse. Um, to give you some sense, there are over 140,000 calls a year to child line. About 69,000 of those are for child abuse. That is a tremendous number of phone calls that we're talking about. Um, this really is probably one of the most important parts of our CPS system. If the initial um, call is either not taken, and I'm going to talk about that, or something is done improperly, um, the system itself can no longer function, and the public confidence in the system is no longer there. Um, so the testimony to the task force has identified a lot of very specific problems, and I'm going to touch on those and their solutions. In terms of staffing, um, we heard a testimony about the fact that there's almost always vacancies, that these are hard positions to fill. They are full-time only positions. They often require a lot of overtime. The number of dropped calls in 2011 was 8.7 percent, meaning that percent of people called and hung up before the call was ever taken. It doesn't mean that they didn't call back, but we don't know how many of those calls were calls where children needed to be protected. Um, and there also have been very long holds at some points. So we've made several suggestions to address these. Um, we've asked to explore the possibility of part-time work. There are many former and active Child Protective Services workers who have a tremendous amount of experience who could staff, it doesn't have to physically be at Childline, who could help staff this um, and provide additional coverage. Um, and so that, I said, hopefully that will help. We need to keep this fully staffed at all times. And we're likely going to need to have more workers at Childline given some of the other recommendations that I'm going to discuss. Um, the second one is an inefficiency with the Childline system. Most people don't realize this. At this point, it is all paper. Um, somebody takes the call. They write it down in a paper. They pick up the telephone. They call the Child Protective's person, and they tell them the same thing. It's like telephone tag. And then they take the report. They put it in an envelope, send it by U.S. mail to the police. Um, there is almost no other system in this country that still works with this paper system, where essentially is a game of telephone, um, because each person is now calling somebody else. Um, clearly, this is inefficient, but also there's room for inaccuracy. Um, so our, one of our suggestions is to allow for electronic transmission of reports, um, both from the mandated reporter to Childline and from Childline to the police and to the local CPS, which means if it's electronic, they don't need to sit on the phone and rehash what they've just heard, and the police will get the information immediately. Um, the next issue that I was asked to talk about was GPS tracking. This is General Protective Services. Um, as many of you know, we have a differential response in Pennsylvania. We have GPS, which is General Protective Services, and CPS, which is Child Protective Services. Traditionally, um, Childline CPS calls went to Childline. GPS calls went to the county. Um, historically, people have thought of GPS as less severe, not as important, and to have children at lower risk. Um, the data shows us that this isn't true. We've heard testimony from multiple, multiple people that GPS may actually, those children may actually be at higher risk. Um, when they have, people have looked at subsequent reports within 18 months of an initial GPS, the rate of re-abuse may actually be even higher than children with CPS reports. Um, and in fact, some of the most publicized case recently, um, a death in Philadelphia, were children who had had multiple, multiple GPS level reports. Um, GPS also in large part is about patterns. And so if, um, if the counties are each individually collecting information, a child moves from one county to another, there is no way to know that that child has been in a different county. Um, so one of our suggestions is that all calls go to child line, whether it's a GPS or a CPS. Every single call is ultimately tracked by child line. People can still call their local counties, but then the counties will need to call those calls or electronically transmit the calls to child line. All of them will be tracked. Currently, we have no way to track our GPS cases, so we really don't have a good sense of how many children are even being served or in the system or how many repeat calls we have in different counties. So we are suggesting that all calls be tracked and everything be tracked at the level of the state. 
and that they are tracked by both child and perpetrator. So if there's a perpetrator in multiple counties and there's multiple reports, there will now be a way to link that there are the same perpetrator in multiple counties. Similarly, if the same child is a subject of five or six reports, that clearly represents a different level of risk. Um, the other thing is currently all reports that are not um, indicated are expunged at 15 months after the report, so you have no record that that report ever existed. We're recommending that there is no expungement of reports. Um, it will not be released after a certain amount of time, but the data will exist. So even after 15 months, we can link perpetrators and children. And as we saw with Sandusky, it was many, many years between different reports. So this will help to link those different cases over time. Again, this information is not going to be released, but it will be available um, to help with the safety of children. The third issue is information sharing. Um, we've had multiple people testify, and I know from my own experience that lack of information sharing is a very important problem. Um, children's pediatricians or their primary care providers really serve as the safety net for young children um, in our society. There is often no other person um, outside the family who sees a child who's three months old, six months old, nine months old, except their pediatrician. Uh, once kids are in school, the school acts as their safety net. So the only non-family with constant contact may be that child's pediatrician. Mm -hmm. We would like to move toward a system where child protective services and the medical profession, and particularly primary care physicians, are a team that are caring for the child and there's a free flow of information. So we're recommending very explicitly that there is no parental consent required for the PCP to talk to CYF or vice versa, and that HIPAA, although it's, HIPAA does not apply in cases of child abuse, we are going to explicitly state that so that there cannot be a misinterpretation of the meaning of free flow of information in cases of child abuse. Um, CPS, we're also asking that CPS be allowed to contact the PCP whenever they are involved in a child's life and providing services. One of our um, people that testified stated that about 40% of her children at any one time were getting services from CPS, and she had no idea which ones of those patients were getting services. Um, so we need open communication. Um, and again, this is what's the best for children in our system. Finally, I was asked to talk about Child Protective Services worker training. Um, in the report, there is a quote from uh, Richard Gellis, which I think summarizes what the issue is. He says, protecting children from abuse and neglect is not brain surgery, it is much harder. Brain surgeons have the advantage of a decade of specialized training and the use of the latest and most advanced technology. Frontline CPS workers have only a bachelor's degree in the liberal arts and a job tenure of three to five years, which actually for some counties is very long. We have some counties where the average tenure is under a year. The latest technology in CPS is a cell phone and, if budget allows, a laptop. And I often say to people, we send our police officers out two in a car with guns, and we send our CPS workers by themselves with a cell phone. Um, the CPS worker is, should be, the center of the CYF system, and we need to support them and train them and make it something like Teach for America where people want to do it and want to help children. Um, so our solutions or suggestions to support our CPS workers much more. Information sharing will help them to be part of a team so they work with other people in other systems. Um, we're recommending to review and analyze how we hire and retain CPS workers. Feeling supported is a critical role for not being burned out, and we need to explore how we can do that for the CPS workers. And we need to enhance supervision. Um, just because you get promoted from a caseworker to a supervisor does not mean you have the skill set to act as a supervisor. And we need to help train those supervisors so they can truly supervise our CPS workers. So those are the four, in a nutshell, um, issues that I was asked to address, and I can ask, uh, answer any questions at the end. Uh, I was going to make a comment that I think that all of what we've said today is what we'd like to see as a culture change. And truly that this, as a culture, ideally in the whole country, but specifically in Pennsylvania, where children come first and child abuse prevention, whether it's primary, secondary, tertiary, in any form, is part of that culture. And I think, I said, having been in Canada many times, everybody there is a mandated reporter. And everybody feels like child abuse is their responsibility. And it's a culture. And it's very hard to explain what a culture is, but we don't have it. Um, and we see it in our everyday lives where people will say to me, oh, we have, you have three child abuse physicians in Western Pennsylvania? You need three? We could have 12 and we wouldn't have enough. People have no sense because of all the stigma, of all the, the only thing we ever hear about CPS is bad, right? And the only time it's ever in the press is when it's negative. And so I think as a culture, 
we need to change. And so all these things, little by little, change a culture, but no one of them is going to do it by itself.